former House Rules Committee Chief of Staff Donald Wolfensberger and University of Pennsylvania Professor Kathleen Hall Jamison. Congressman David Dreyer of California chairs the two and a half hour hearing. I uh, guess we will proceed. The uh, subcommittee will come to order. Uh, this morning, the subcommittee will continue in its attempt to examine the issues raised by Professor Kathleen Hall Jamison in her report entitled Civility in the House of Representatives. The subcommittee began testimony on April 17th, which seems like eons ago, from Professor Jamison, Dean of the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania, and our distinguished former Chief of Staff, Donald Wolfensberger, guest scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. At the end of their oral testimony, the hearing was interrupted by a series of roll call votes on the House floor to resolve a matter that is the subject of this hearing, and then by an historic statement by the Speaker of the House of Representatives regarding his reimbursement to the Committee on Standards of Official Conduct. <coughs> Due to the scheduling constraints of both uh, the members of this subcommittee and some of our witnesses, the remainder of the hearing was postponed until this morning, and I'd like to express my gratitude to the witnesses for their patience and understanding and for their willingness to return here this morning. I would point out, however, that it took a lot of effort on my part to get a few of my colleagues to cooperate with us by staging a confrontation on the House floor to illustrate the problems that we are discussing at this hearing. And uh, as Professor uh, Frenzich said, uh, it was a bit like life imitating art. Uh, <laughs> Kathleen and Don, we've uh, had plenty of time uh, to, uh, more than the usual amount of time to digest your testimony from two weeks ago. Uh, your prepared statements were included in the record, uh, and uh, we would uh, like to proceed with questions. I should add parenthetically, since you opened the last hearing by uh, extending greetings from our longtime family friend, Walter Annenberg, I've had a lengthy discussion with him about exactly what ensued, and I assume that your ears were burning uh, when we uh, had our discussion, uh, and he said that what we're trying to do here today should in fact be a blow for decency and civility, so he's strongly committed to, uh, to our effort here and is very proud of, of your fine work. Uh, let me uh, say that, uh, why don't, before I begin uh, asking any questions, see if either of my colleagues would like to make any comment <coughs> about what led to uh, our uh, recessing the hearing last time and uh, where we are now. So. Uh, Tony, if you... Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I found it interesting that we were having a discussion about lying, yeah. that you were not supposed to use the word, you are a liar, because it was not proper language. All members know that you're not supposed to use that kind of language and only produces the kind of results that, uh, you know, breaks up the place and makes it look very, by, or very partisan. And I found myself in the roll call, and we went downstairs and said, what is the roll call? They said, well, a member called another member a liar. I thought, That's, this is interesting. <laughs> what, you know, what am I going to do on this one? Because we found ourselves in a, we were voting along party lines. And I found myself, you know. Remembering what you were doing upstairs. Remembering what I was doing upstairs and voting, you know, uh, saying that the person cannot call another person a liar, regardless of what party it is. And uh, it's, uh, I don't know how we're going to proceed, Mr. Chairman, but I, I do know that um, we're very concerned as a, as a minority, as all minorities are, and, and uh, there's so much mistrust uh, among us. I think that happens when certainly the parties change. You know, we were, our party was in power for a number of years, and then the other party takes over, and there's a tremendous mistrust. And I find it interesting that uh, a recent survey of congressional staff showed that more than half uh, thought we are in a very bipartisan cooperation. That was among Republican staff, but among Democratic staff, only 27% of the Democratic staff agreed. So, uh, in other words, I, I, I suspect it was probably that way mm -hmm. when uh, the Democrats were in power. So it's, it's a kind of an uh, ingrained kind of a thing. And how we address this, I look forward to questions and, and your comments. 
But at least you know that with this hearing, we are making an attempt to uh, address this concern that obviously does exist um, in your party. Thank you, Tony. Mr. Vice Chairman diaz Villart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I recall the uh, <coughs> testimony of the witnesses of April 17th well, and uh, uh, thought it was very, uh, very important testimony. And so I uh, have a couple of questions, but uh, at this point, uh, I would defer to you with regard to uh, how we best proceed. But again, uh, again, I would uh, join you, Mr. Chairman, in welcoming the, our distinguished witnesses once again. Thank you very much, Lincoln. Let me uh, just proceed by raising an issue that, uh, that that both of you talked about, and and you, Kathleen, mentioned the issue of um, having the chair work to better enforce the rules of decorum. Uh, in the House, and and you, Don, talked about the your proposal for dealing with exhibits. Now, in looking at both of those items, I, I could just hear uh, one say, "Well, this is a first step towards stifling debate, jeopardizing First Amendment rights of of members." If you've got the chair being heavy-handed, if you've got rules that are going to limit the opportunity for utilize exhibits, for utilization of exhibits, this creates um, a tough time. How would you all? respond to that, to that criticism that would come forward? I think that the concern that you express about the appearance of heavy handedness is a very real concern and it is legitimate. The, there is, however, in many of the state legis legislatures, as the members know, a tradition in which the chair is more interventionistic without creating the sense that the chair is heavy handed. And I think that is able to occur when there are very clear guidelines that, that guide the intervention. Uh, so, for example, one of the suggestions that we made in the report was that, that the chair intervene when a nickname is attached to a member um, on, the, on the grounds that the, the rules very clearly specify that it's inappropriate, but also that that, that that is moving the debate to a level that may later be problematic. And so I think if one were, were fairly clear about the, the areas of concern, uh, that one might be able to preempt some problems. Uh, secondly, uh, we recommended that not simply that the chair exercise more vigilance, but that the parties exercise more vigilance in, in trying to preempt discourse that's problematic on the part of their own members. I think a heightened sense on the part of all of the individuals involved that the, the process of taking down should be used very, very seldom, that it should be an extraordinary process, not an ordinary process as it had become for only one year mm -hmm. of the 104th Congress, uh, could potentially create a different kind of a relationship in which Unless one wants to, to take two hours out of the House's time for a day, and occasionally one, one might for, for tactical reasons, but I don't think one would want to for deliberative reasons, that one might act, want to act proactively to prevent those kinds of situations from escalating. Mm -hmm. I would agree and just second that by recalling for you my proposal that uh, you have a two strikes and you're out approach on a uh, breach of decorum, whereby the Speaker would advise a member if he's crossed the line and if that member persists and does it again, the speaker would order him under Clause 4 of Rule 14 to immediately sit down. And I think that if the chair makes it clear to all members ahead of time, if this new policy, this new interventionist policy, if you will, is, uh, is instituted, that I think members will understand that, uh, why this is being done. And also, I think it would be made clear in the uh, intervening time uh, what the precedents are on, on saying certain things. And I think by now, members mm -hmm. should be fully aware they don't call another member or the president a liar. And, uh, you know, I've seen it on both sides of the aisle where the uh, integrity or motives or whatever of uh, the president or one of the party leaders is called into question on the House floor, and that's, that should not be done. And I, I don't think it's an issue of free speech. The fact is uh, Rule 14 is a curb on free speech for good reason. That is, you are here to debate policy and not personalities. If members really feel this is a free speech issue, then they should introduce a resolution that says members may engage in personalities on the floor and see how mm -hmm. far it gets. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think members want to start talking trash. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we've found with the uh, advent of television coverage uh, and all is that when there have been uh, battles that have taken place at the committee level, uh, we see members leave the committee and come to the House floor to vent that anger and, and frustration. And I wondered if you have any thoughts about uh, the juxtaposition between what takes place in committee and what's going on on the House floor, maybe how we can uh, address the issue of civility uh, within congressional committees. I think that we, we saw a number of instances as we looked at the history in which it was clear that what was happening on the floor didn't originate on the floor. That, in fact, a, a discussion that, that had gone over the line someplace else 
and had not then been contained was now moving into a form in which it was more highly disruptive of the entire day uh, in a number of cases resulting in a taking down process that took you know, over an hour and a half of, of, the, of the House's collective time. I think it, it, it is important to remember that your rules apply in committee as well as in, mm -hmm. on the floor and to ask whether, in fact, the chairs who are chairing those committees should not you know, ha assume a, a comparable level of responsibility to the best speakers pro tempore, which is a responsibility to try to ensure that, that the conduct in the committees themse themselves is appropriate. Uh, I think it, it's particularly unfortunate when, when you have members of the leadership on either side uh, in, in hearings engaged in very tense exchanges. Uh, because then you've got the, the individuals whom you'd ordinarily expect to dampen down the tensions, creating a role modeling for the other mm -hmm. members that expand the latitude of, of appropriate discourse. Mm -hmm. And I think that's particularly troubling. But much of that occurred in the first session of the 104th when you had the transition in power. And so that there, there has been somewhat less of that more recently. It may be starting to correct itself. Uh, my experience in the last Congress was that some of the things that gave rise to people coming from a committee to the floor and raising some objections publicly was that uh, there was clear misunderstanding. Some chairmen, subcommittee chairmen, were very new to the job. They were not fully aware of the rules, how to implement them, enforce them, and they, uh, they did abuse the rules without fully knowing. And so I think that's one of the reasons why the uh, Rules Committee now is helping to to head up a parliamentary assistance program to, mm -hmm. to better train some of the staff of uh, committee chairman and subcommittee chairman. Uh, so that's part of the problem. The other part is there will be some, some clear abuses or some heavy-handedness, and I guess going to the floor is one way to raise it uh, publicly, but I, you know, I would urge all members to first of all try and work things out behind the scenes with staff and the, the committee chairman and also uh, to uh, draw on the assistance of the parliamentarian, which uh, the parliamentarian's office really is, I think, a neutral and objective office that can assist to, to smooth out any problems that do arise in the committees. And we're glad that you started that program of uh, training for both members and staff. Mr. Chairman, if I could just add mm -hmm. something. The, the, the assumption underlying much of this kind of discussion is that the chair or the speaker pro tem is a partisan. And I think mm -hmm. that, that when one invests the person with that office, that person is assuming a role above partisanship. And it, what that means is that when the member, when that chair's own party is behaving inappropriately, that person must be scrupulous in ensuring that the same kind of actions are being taken as would be taken on the other side. And one of the, the tendencies in more recent times that I think are a special concern, and Congressman Hall raised it, is the, the extent to which the, this process has become a partisan process. Mm -hmm. And it begins to look as if the majority and minority now place their own partisan interests above the interests of the House. In the past, it was more likely that when you had a taking down process, your votes would not be along party line. And it was more likely that you wouldn't see the process continuing to go all the way through where someone objected to the member continuing to, to, uh, to proceed in order. Mm -hmm. And at, at a certain point, I, I think one needs to ask whether we, we ought to reconceptualize the role of speaker pro tem and chairs and committees to remind the individuals that in some systems that person actually gives up party affiliation mm -hmm. when he assumes that role because it makes it clearer to everyone that this is a neutral representative of the institution. And however, some very difficult moments, both the Republicans and Democrats have taken down their own members, which suggests that, that there are very clear instances in which the parties are capable of acting in the, in the higher well-being of the institution. And in those moments, they reinforce institutional norms and, and move partisanship down in, in, the, in the perception of, of importance in, in, in its institutional hierarchy. And I think, I think they, they, that as a result, conceptualizing that role to be a role that's absolutely neutral and fair is extremely important. And one of the reasons that we featured some of what appear to be inconsistencies in rulings from the chair was to say that when members perceive that the inconsistency is driven by partisanship and that one party is being disadvantaged and the other advantaged, and that usually means that the majority party is being advantaged and the minority party disadvantaged, mm -hmm. then you're going to have an escalation in the discourse because you have the perception that the process is no longer an institutional process. It's now a partisan process. And I see your goal as a committee in ensuring that it's an institutional process and that safeguards the well-being of the deliberative function and in the process protects the ability of strong partisans right. to behave in their own interest. Let me just raise one more question that I want to call on my colleagues. Um, over the last several weeks, um, I've had the thrill of uh, managing totally non-controversial rules on the floor that dealt with simply extending the consideration of suspension days. And those became great battles because members of the minority wanted to, in fact, raised the issue of campaign finance reform, which obviously is being hotly discussed around here. And yet we really have not had what I think is 
uh, a proper forum uh, for consideration of it. Many people in the media have tried to make this a black and white or a really very simple issue, but the issue of campaign finance and the debate over First Amendment rights and the kinds of limitations that some are proposing is a very complex one. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the other thrills that I had uh, four years ago was to be a, a captain of the first bipartisan, by, uh, yeah, it was a bipartisan Oxford-style debate that we had downstairs on the issue of trade and human rights. And uh, I was very privileged to be part of that effort. And w what I'm wondering is if you all have any thoughts about whether or not we should go back to the Oxford-style debates. Our friend Norm Ornstein and, and Tom Mann have worked long and hard on this, on this question. And I wonder if, as we look at this issue, that there's been frustration over campaign finance reform if going to Oxford-style debates might be a good thing. I think the, the one-minute speeches are now becoming a forum to move items onto the floor that, that don't really have another venue. And, and you're also seeing in your deliberative process people using a, a subterfuge to move items into debate. I think moving to a structured environment in which one can guarantee that those kinds of issues are ventilated. With, with strong partisans who can articulate clearly the philosophical differences and also show the evidence on each side would have a number of beneficial effects. One, it would provide the outlet for those kinds of exchanges. Two, it would improve the quality of debate on some of those issues as one is still framing the legislation and one is moving through the rest of the process. Three, I think the American people you know, could learn a great deal about the philosophical differences between the parties and also, importantly, because one of your Oxford debates was actually bipartisan. You had Democrats and Republicans on right. each side. Indicate the areas in which there, there, there are, th th that the normal divisions by party aren't holding up and the, the complexities of the issue as a result can be understood in different terms. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a big fan of Oxford debates. And I think those who wrote them off after the experiment in 1994 did so unfairly. It takes a long time for people to get used to a new forum. It takes a long time to build an audience for that forum. I think it would be a wonderful idea to, to try to conventionalize Do you think there would be an audience forum? I mean, what, what, what would it take to build an audience for it? I, I think that if one scheduled them on a regular predictable basis so that one could find them, if one promoted them in advance so that the C-SPAN viewership at least knew that they were going to be there, that you'd be able to attract at least the audience for those debates that you attract for the one-minute speeches. And that those people who feel the need in one-minute speeches now to digest what are complex arguments down to simplicities and to engage in hyperbole when, in fact, they would engage in nuanced discussion if they had a different form, because these are intelligent people of goodwill who understand the evidence. I think you would see a shift in the tenor of the debate within, within the parties on those issues. And I, I think your C-SPAN audience, which is an intelligent, involved audience, at the minimum, would be attentive. I think, secondly, you'd see attention from the press, particularly if this became a vehicle for clarifying party differences. One of the problems in our democratic structure is that we use debates as a vehicle for vetting candidates, not for vetting party differences. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the presidential and candidate debates take on two burdens. Is this the right person, and are these the right ideas? If we could find an alternative form, and Congress is the place, to articulate those ideas, we might be able to help those who are interested in the process, particularly the C-SPAN viewers, have a clear understanding of where the party differences are, and reinvigoration of party would be very healthy for democracy as well as the parties. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chairman, I've laid out some detailed ideas in a question and answer uh, uh, paper that I think has been submitted to all the members on, on this question, but uh, let me just summarize them briefly. You might recall uh, from your history back in the uh, early part of the Republic, uh, what the House of Representatives did was uh, we didn't have a standing committee system then. Uh, they would take uh, legislation and, and debate it in general terms in the committee of the whole before sending it to a select committee to work out the details. I think uh, in some ways if we can get back to that idea of having more general debates, and I know that's what the Oxford-style debate was aimed at, but I don't think it was tied you know, maybe closely enough to something that was imminent in the way of action in committees. And so I have suggested that, first of all, get rid of the the name Oxford style debates. I mean, that intimidates people. It's, it's born, it's ivory tower, whatever. Uh, call it, you know, the, uh, the American uh, 21st century challenge debate series or great issues debate series or something, but tie it uh, to some things that the American people can relate to. Secondly, do it uh, during the day rather than, than at night um, and have no other legislative business that day, uh, have no, uh, no committees meeting that day. 
and uh, make sure that other members are involved. It seems to me that uh, you lost the rest of the membership when you did it at night as a, as a special order. Tie it to a resolution that would give general instructions to a committee, even if it's uh, the Committee on uh, House Oversight shall consider and, and report its recommendations on campaign finance reform, but something that members are going to vote at on at the end of the day. And finally, uh, in addition to having your, your lead uh, speakers in the debate, the, the two or three experts from each side, um, allow a time period for other members to get involved, say under the five minute rule, where they can cross examine those uh, leaders or each other, other and uh, get involved in the debate themselves and then have a vote at the end of that period on that uh, resolution so that members know that they're going to be there to vote and they're expected to be there during the debate as well and to participate. So those are my suggestions for maybe livening it up a little bit and making it a bit more you know, relevant to what you're doing. Thank you. Mr. diaz Ballard. I think that was, uh, these are extraordinarily helpful suggestions and, and um, I think that the uh, and Don, by the way, I think that a, a, a name change would be a good idea, but, but what we've been calling the Oxford-style debates, um, making them more, connecting them, making, more, making them more relevant to issues that will be forthcoming in the proceedings of, of the House is a, is, is a very good idea. Uh, and um, I am not to assume from either of you that you believe that those debates should um, substitute for the special orders, but rather complement the special orders. Um, am I correct? Yes, but, but I, I would like to see the, 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 the committee consider the possibility that the one-minute speeches be traded off in favor of a, a debate format that is regular, systematic, with topics that are of importance so that issues that, that cannot otherwise be vented outside the one-minute speeches now have a way to be vented in longer form by people who are the most capable representatives on, the, on that issue of the parties. Because I think your one-minute speeches are, are, a, are a problematic form right now in the House as they're being used. I think they were problematic when the Democrats were in charge, and they're problematic when the Republicans are in charge. And you are now creating enough instances in which the House deliberation is being disrupted by taking down processes that are the result of of actions or speech, or words in, in one minute speeches, to suggest that, that if for no other reason, ensuring that you're able to deliberate on a regular schedule would suggest that there, there's some need to be concerned, to be concerned about the one minute speeches. Just to follow up on that, I, I would agree that that should complement special orders and, and uh, not replace them. There were a couple of instances when uh, we were in the minority that uh, Speaker O'Neill considered uh, terminating television coverage at the end of the legislative business without even a rule change. And we reminded him of the legislative history of the House broadcast rule that said uh, there shall be gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage, and that doesn't mean just legislative business. Uh, and, you know, the reason was that he was very upset with some of the things that were being said during special orders. But I think they serve a valuable function. They're sort of a, a release valve, uh, not only for the minority party and on issues that maybe they're not getting to consider on the floor, but for even junior members within the majority party that are maybe a bit frustrated that things aren't moving as they would like to see. So, uh, you know, certainly keep the special orders. Uh, I think it's a good idea. On one minute, though, I had made the suggestion that you bump those that uh, relate to uh, uh, political views or, or views on legislation at the end of the day, but you still allow one minute factual announcements at the beginning of the day that are less uh, contentious and wouldn't poison the well of the House. That seems to be a little difficult to enforce uh, because uh, I could see people saying, oh, no, no, I have a factual one minute, uh, and then not necessarily it being as, as, it could as be factual. Gained. No uh, but, but, but I do think that, that there, there certainly should be a distinction between the, the one minutes and the five minute special orders uh, uh, and, and the possibility then for the, for the one hour special orders in extraordinary, extraordinary times. Um, because the way I, I view, and, and I think that you're in agreement, uh, the special order process is that um, there are issues uh, that are able to be espoused and debated or uh, spoken about uh, that are minority issues. They would not necessarily be issues of interest uh, to the Oxford-style debate, uh, they, uh, at, at least at every, at every uh, time, uh, at every moment. So that's why I think that the, uh, the special order process is, is uh, very, very necessary and, and uh, important. Uh, but um, one, one other... Um, point that I'd just like to 
bounce off of uh, both of you. The the and 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 you, you brought out the uh, the point of uh, the fact that in some parliaments the uh, the speaker the presiding officer is totally nonpartisan. Uh, what ideas would you have? Obviously, we're not going to go that far, but uh, to um, to achieve as much as possible, as much as possible through concrete measures, um, the um, uh, the uh, total and perceived objectivity of the speaker. Uh, suggestions along those lines, for example, that the people who preside would have to go through special training, if you will. Do you have any ideas as to that? It, it seemed true to us as we read across the historical record that there were real differences in the capacities of the speakers pro tem. Some were extremely comfortable in very difficult situations and navigated them with the, the kind of skill that suggested a master of diplomacy. Some members just you know, malfunctioned. Um, and, and as a result, the chair was not acting in ways that dampened down tension and moved the process forward, but actually was acting in ways that increased the likelihood that tension would escalate. And so, for example, one, one indicator to us was when, when parliamentary inquiries were being misused, the strong speaker pro tem would refuse to acknowledge the person who was continuing to try to do that in order to keep the process moving. And we asked what differentiated those two. First, it was the length of the, t of the service that the person had put in, in in comparable kinds of capacities. But secondly, there was a high relationship between members who had had, been, had, had active chairing roles in their state legislatures. And as a result, had developed over time a real temperamental skill a di and a, a disposition to, in, in those ways that you cannot, cannot ever set rules about, um, work well. And, and so I, I think, among other things, that when you know something that is a tense situation is moving through Congress, and unfortunately in recent times there have been more of those, not less, it's important that you have people who have, have a lot of past experience and also who are perceived to be fair by the minority so that you, you are not in a situation in which someone who is perceived to be a highly articulate you know, party spokesperson is now in the chair. Because if that person in the chair you know, it makes anything that looks like a misstep, it's going to be interpreted as, as partisanship when, in fact, it might simply be in, in the tension of the moment if the person hasn't reacted appropriately. Those, are the, those would be the two things that I would suggest. We did, on, in the special order area, make one recommendation that I think is very important for consideration. There is a parliamentary dilemma in special orders created by the fact that you cannot carry through the process of appealing a ruling from the chair. And we, we saw very clear language in special orders, and I'm a big fan of special orders. They are the one remaining form of extended expository discourse in Congress. But there was clear discourse in the special orders that had it occurred during the regular day would have been taken down. And it was clear that the chair only felt comfortable, even the best of chairs, the best of speaker pro tems, cautioning because if you did anything else in that circumstance, you were going to set up a, a parliamentary system that you couldn't carry through. And so we recommended that you think about changing the rules so that there, there is an ability to intervene, but the intervention, if the ruling really of the chair is, is, is appealed, takes place the next day as it goes through the, the congressional cycle and where the, the, the members actually have a chance to vote since you can't assemble them during special order time. And the reason for suggesting that was we thought it would have a prophylactic effect. If you knew that that could happen, you'd be less likely to continue and continue and continue to overstep. And the reason that we were particularly concerned was we found a number of instances in which those kinds of things, uninterrupted, unsanctioned in special orders, carried over the next morning into one-minute speeches, where the other party came back in one-minute speeches, now creating a debate over what had been said the night before, which then escalated tensions in one-minute speeches and disrupted the next legislative day. So it seemed to us there was a very good reason to try to increase the sense that this would not be tolerated and was going to be inappropriate to minimize the likelihood that it would happen and be disruptive. Thank you both very much, and Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, um, just to follow up on that, um, you know, some of our speaker pro tems are pretty good on their feet because they've had experience. Others are, they feel, you know, like, like a fish out of water in being a presiding officer. It's a very difficult thing to learn. And, um, you know, some legislatures, some parliaments, they, I forget what they call the presiding officer, maybe speaker or something. Has there been any discussion about, you know, they, when they, 
like in Canada, for example, they pick a presiding officer that has uh, great respect among both parties, and uh, his number one job in the parliament is to be the speaker, not the speaker in power, as we, as we understand it, but the speaker as a presiding officer. Have you discussed that or put that uh, point forward? We, we didn't explicitly discuss it in the report because it would be such a drastic change in the, in the conventions of the House. There, there is, however, an informal structure that does tend to work that way. When we examined those moments in which something inappropriate was happening on the floor and there was a strong intervention by, by senior members on the floor, these members were the people who are respected in both parties, who had the standing and, and the, what, what rhetorical scholars call the ethos to come into the environment and to, to essentially help direct this process down. I, I think your suggestion is a very good one, worthy of consideration, because we saw individuals able to perform that role, even though there wasn't a structure that was naturally inviting it. And there are members on both sides who are able to perform that role. Uh, we also, when we interviewed the reporters, asked them historically, had there been individuals who in tense times had been able to ensure that the debate was able to continue to be, to be deliberately, appro deliberately appropriate, and generated a list of those people historically who appeared to be able to stand above party when necessary in order to ensure the process would move forward, and they would be ideal candidates for that sort of a move. If I might uh, answer that, um, yeah, I don't think we're going to get to the, the point that the, uh, the British Parliament or the Canadian uh, Parliament has uh, of, of developing you know, a speaker that's non-nonpartisan. Uh, the presiding officer, uh, though, has to be neutral and, and nonpartisan in making rulings and so on. But I think the, the key is getting people that are trained. And, and I know at the beginning of the 104th Congress, when we were new, there was a, a, an attempt to really uh, train people that were going to be in the chair. Uh, I don't know if that is still ongoing, but I'm a little troubled that it, it might not be. And I think that that has to be an ongoing uh, effort and even some coaching before the day session begins. Uh, when the outbreak of incivility occurred uh, on April 17th when we were here testifying, I noticed that there were three one minutes uh, prior to the one where the violation occurred, where the words were taken down, where the exact same violation occurred, and yet there was no warning at all from the chair. The chair at that time was a very junior member and probably was a little bit shy, even if the parliamentarian had been urging that uh, speaker or that uh, speaker pro tem. To, uh, to weigh and advise members that they cannot impugn the motives or veracity of other members uh, in their speeches, and maybe that could have headed things off, but there was no intervention even after the first violation occurred. It wasn't until the fourth one uh, occurred that uh, somebody asked that the words be taken down. So I think there just has to be more intervention from the chair and more uh, training and coaching of the uh, presiding officers. Well, it's a good point. I, but, you know, this has to be built into the leadership as well as to the members of the Congress, and it, and it hasn't been built in in a long time, because I, I find that the leaders themselves are the ones that uh, are the most difficult relative to partisan efforts. And I don't know if that's a new thing, but then we also have about 25 radicals, uh, I'm, I'm guessing, on each side, Republican and Democrat, that really stir the pot. And the leaders kind of fall into this. Uh, they fall into this problem. So. I think the leaders need to be trained in this, too, because they don't oftentimes step in when they ought to step in. Do you have any comments on that? I, I think, indeed, they, the problem is that the theme teams guided by the leadership are creating the one-minute speeches, which are, are designed to be so thematically yeah. consistent that something will get into evening news <coughs> that sets the frame for the day's discussion. And one of the problems that I saw the day that we adjourned the hearing uh, was that it, when one now goes back to that record, and a member says, well, what is the rule that dictates the point at which your words are going to be taken down? One would say, well, it's the fourth time someone calls someone a liar, <laughs> um, rather than the first, second, or third. And so the, it, what, what it invites in the newer, newer members who lack the, the sense of the culture, it invites them to think is that the, the rules are somewhat flexible. Um, and then it raises the question, well, why that member and not some other member? And you can say, well, it's because there's something that's, that's partisan about that exchange at that point. Or you could say, for example, in a number of instances where it was a woman being taken down, um, well, perhaps it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's easier to, you know, for people to, to identify this when it's a woman saying it than when it's a man saying it. And yeah. at that point, you're, you're now getting into partisan explanations, gender explanations, instead of structural explanations. Structural explanations probably being you know, the people who, who could have who've said we, we demand that the words be taken down uh, decided that they would just let it go to see if it wouldn't dampen down on its own, and it didn't, and nothing else is there trying to create that restraint because members of the own par their own party 
are up there with the theme team trying to ensure that those words get through in order to make news in a day in which the speaker is coming to the floor, and hence that is going to be the sound bite for the other side. Also, I find that there are a lot of members of Congress, uh, and this always seems to surprise people in the country, of good character. Mm -hmm. A lot of members, and on both sides. And there's a lot of members that get along with each other in a bipartisan fashion. A lot of members, the families know one another, uh, they know their children, they travel together, uh, and they build up these relationships. There's even a, a prayer breakfast that meets every Thursday morning right downstairs here among Democrats and Republicans. There are, and, and bills are passed, things are done every day here that are very, I mean, I wish they would be not so quiet. Uh, I wish the public knew about it because when I've talked about this around the country, people find this amazing that Republicans and Democrats get along, that what they see on television or what they hear in the newspaper, that it looks like all we do is fight all the time, when it's overwhelmingly the other way. But if you were to read the media, it's, I mean, it's just, you don't have to answer this, but I mean, you don't have to address this issue, but this is the frustrating thing to me, is that we, so many people here, we cause our own problems. Which leads into the, the other question that so many of the members anymore are new. In the last four years, I think two-thirds of the Congress is new, and so a lot of members don't know one another. It's be, this, this city has become a suitcase city. Mm -hmm. Everybody goes home on the weekends, and uh, so members don't know one another. They're here for three, three and a half days, and they go back to their districts. Some members have bragged that they've never owned a passport. They won't own a passport, so they won't travel. I mean, they're like... They're in a fog. And I find that the, the older members are the ones that have built the relationships over the years. But the, with the newer members, there's, there's not much of a relationship, which is very dangerous, I think, for the institution. I think the kinds of things that we had at Hershey are very, very good. Do you have other ideas of how we might uh, develop these relationships uh, when, in fact, so many people are young, so many people are new to the legislature. They don't know one another. They come in with a very partisan feeling that they, they've got to hurt the other person or hurt the other party, and it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, Congressman, let, let, let me tell you an, an anecdote that, that I think is very revealing. When the Gulf War debate was taking place, a friend of mine came up to me and said, where did all those intelligent, thoughtful members of Congress come from we didn't elect them in the last election cycle. And you know, we, we had come through a campaign that was not an elevated campaign in which you didn't see the intelligence or the philosophical differences between candidates. But the best of the members emerged in the process of that debate. I think there, the challenge for Congress is finding a venue in which the members are going to be able to become accustomed to an alternative form of discourse that is less campaign-like and more like deliberation in a public setting. I'm as concerned that members learn to get along in public in the, the, the deliberative process as that they get, to, they get to know each other in private. I think there's definitely going to be a positive advantage if they get to know each other in private. But if they get to know each other in private and the venues available in Congress to express partisan differences don't encourage productive deliberation, I think you minimize the likelihood that those personal relationships are going to translate into what I think is our goal which is a deliberation that brings forward the best ideas on both sides so that the best possible legislation is offered for the country. And I think over time, the Oxford debate format would have the advantage of featuring the deliberative sensibilities of the members in, in issue environments in which your experts are being put forward, which would lead people to conclude that the people in Congress, in fact, have a, a deep concern about issues, but also are highly knowledgeable something you only see when you watch hearings mm. on C-SPAN, something which you rarely <coughs> see when you're watching the debate on the floor, which is not really debate by any reasonable definition anymore, right. which you don't see in the one-minute speeches, which look like campaign discourse much of the time. Mm. And so I, I would urge, considering an alternative venue in which the members are able to do what they were elected to do, which is to reason publicly and deliberate in ways that let the public you know, see a sense of, of a consensus around the issues that are being advanced. I think in order to do that, you have to get back to more four and five day work weeks here in Congress and, and get away from the two and a half, three day weeks when members hardly get to know their staff, let alone other members. 
And uh, I, I think that's needed primarily for the, for, from the standpoint of the legislative process, both in your committees and on the floor, but also the byproduct would be getting to know other members better. And, uh, and you, know, you just have to be around a bit more here and, and do what the, the Senate at least tried, and that is take a, a week off after every four weeks to go back and, and have your district work period. But, uh, but spend more time here in Washington on, on lawmaking, on oversight, and I think you'll find more members getting involved in bipartisan legislative projects. Maybe they are not going to have a, a lot of more informal time together, but uh, some of my most rewarding moments uh, as a staffer and the members that I work for were having the opportunity to work on some bipartisan projects that required meetings outside of your committee meetings. So maybe 4 o'clock your, your bipartisan task force on campaign reform or whatever could get together and, and in that way members got to know each other better. But uh, those tend to be the most rewarding because they had a better chance of getting somewhere on the House floor too because of the bipartisan support that was developed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. I'd like to follow on. Um, one of the items that, that, that Tony raised and just share with you from my personal experience in, in talking about flexibility and enforcement of the rules and uh, the responsibility of the chair, um, I was thrown very early on in the 104th Congress on several uh, very difficult occasions with the uh, responsibility of uh, wielding the gavel downstairs. And uh, I guess it was just by virtue of being a member of this committee that, uh, that I was asked on several occasions to deal with it. And I will tell you that, that uh, on more than a couple of occasions, uh, I was accused by members of my own party of having a heavy gavel. And, uh, and, and in fact, uh, bending over backwards in behalf of the minority. Um, and I tried just to be as even-handed as possible uh, myself. But uh, there is, in fact, uh, some pressure uh, from just people who, who don't particularly uh, like the way a ruling would go on one side or another. So it does um, create a problem. But I will tell you that I could not agree with you more on this issue of flexibility. I mean, it should be the first and not the fourth time that someone uses the word liar because uh, there can be an interpretation of favoritism. And, and I think the, the larger you know, question is, how do you learn the culture of the House? And I think mm -hmm. if you just looked at what has happened in the last three years, the culture that you would learn, apart from what you state in your rule guides, um, is one which suggests that you, you should push the limits as far as you can on the expectation that they're unevenly enforced. And so uh, you, know, you, you reasonably are going to get by with it um, on enough occasions to make the gambit worthwhile. And then what Congressman Hall suggests comes into play, there are media rewards mm -hmm. if you are a high, high ideological partisan trying to play to a specific right. constituency, constituency um, in, in order to overstep the line because you'll get publicity that you would not otherwise get because you're not representing the, the consensus of Congress and you're not in the leadership. Well, obviously the media likes this, you know, confrontation and clash and all. Do you think that putting some sort of retreat together with uh, people in the media would be a worthwhile uh, goal for us? I mean, some have talked about that. I, I think you, you, should, you should ask representatives of the media that. I suspect yeah. representatives of the media would, would view it as an attempt to co-opt them. Right. Uh, and that, that might, in fact, magnify the, yeah. the, the cynicism, which I think is pervasive in a press structure. Um, my colleague Joseph Capella and I just wrote a book called Spiral of Cynicism, which argues that the basic structure of the press now looks at everything as game and strategy and tactic um, rather than as substance and focuses on motive trying to accomplish you know, the partisan ends. And I think if, if that is, in fact, the dominant structure in covering campaigns and governance, mm -hmm. one probably would not be well treated by reporters whom one invited to go to a retreat because it would be viewed as an right. attempt to co-opt the reporter. Mm -hmm. I would agree. I think they would feel that there was an attempt to co-opt. But I think there have, have to be ways to, to reach out to the media and maybe offer them better training as to some of the, the rules and procedures because I think a lot comes through, through misunderstanding on the part of the media. and. Uh, uh, I don't know if the Rules Committee uh, really has that jurisdiction, but at least I think some informal discussions might be helpful with the uh, press galleries as to whether there's anything that uh, can better be provided to them, both in terms of contact with members uh, as well as some, some backup support assistance uh, from staff to, to help them better understand the process and what's going on in the House. We've been joined by Mr. McInnes. You uh, 
I don't think we're here on April 17th when we went through a very interesting exchange and then were called to the House floor and had to adjourn this hearing uh, uh, because of all the conflict that was taking place there. And uh, we've gone through a series of questions here uh, with our two witnesses. If you'd like to, to uh, raise any questions, we'd certainly welcome them. Well, actually, we're just about ready to recess for the vote, and then we're going to go on to our next panel. So this is your one opportunity to grill Don Wolfensberger, Scott. If, uh... <laughs> OK. Well, let me uh, express uh, the appreciation of the subcommittee to both of you for, um, for your fine service, for an excellent report, which has been helpful. I hope you'll stay in touch with us, and we can continue this dialogue on uh, the question of um, civility in the House of Representatives. And we uh, will stand in recess so that I can go down and vote, and then I'll come right back up, and we'll uh, go to our next panel. Thank you very Thank much. You. We stand Thank in recess. You. Thank you. attention on acts of incivility. And we're also joined by uh, Dr. Eric Uslener, as a who is a professor of political science at the University of Maryland at College Park and a specialist in legislative and voter behavior. His research is focused on the link between the public's declining trust in human nature and their attitudes toward politics, government, and civic life more generally. He's the author of the book, The Decline of Comedy in Congress which argues that the growing confrontational nature of political debate uh, mirrors the changes taking place in society. And uh, let me say to both of you that your full written statements will appear in the record. And uh, why don't you go ahead, Steve. We're glad to have you. Thank you. And Thank uh, you. I failed to turn the microphone on, and so I'm going to encourage you to do this. Thank you. I guess after the hearing of two weeks ago, I want to start uh, by, by saying, uh, I was about to say before we were so rudely interrupted, uh, as you said, that uh, it kind of had life imitating art, or perhaps uh, more to my heart, uh, political science theory uh, imitating political reality as we talked about conflict and had some conflict to, uh, uh, to look at. It seems to me that this hearing is based on four premises, uh, three of which I agree with. You know, one is that there's too much unproductive conflict on the floor of Congress. Uh, secondly, unproductive conflict hurts Congress's image. 
Uh, third, that something can be done both about the conflict and Congress's image. And fourth, that the media coverage of Congress deserves much of the blame. I agree with the first three. I, I don't agree with the, uh, uh, the fourth. And let me talk about the fourth just very, very uh, briefly, the idea that the media is the, uh, is the problem. The media can't create stories out of whole cloth. It can embellish stories, it can spread so stories, but it has to have something to work with. And I don't think blaming the messenger you know, does us any good uh, uh, at all. Uh, Congress is at a particular disadvantage when it deals with the media, the electronic media. You're not terribly photogenic. Uh, your decision-making process is much longer than the evening news, uh, uh, news story. So there's a problem of trying to get your image uh, across. But I guess I want to look at that great political philosopher, uh, Walt Kelly, who wrote the Pogo comic strip and told us that great quote, we have met the enemy and he is us. You know, if the House wants a better image, it's got to clean up its own act. Uh, that doesn't absolve the media of all of its problems, but uh, if you don't give them much to work with, uh, you know, you're going to get a lot better coverage. So I don't agree with the premise that we have to focus on the media you know, per se. I'd like to talk about a couple steps towards a solution. There seem to be two categories of solutions. One is in the culture and attitudes of Congress and its members, and the secondly is in the rules and procedures. Let me start briefly on the attitude and culture. This is probably the most important and probably the most difficult. Members of Congress, whether they're new or they're, whether they've been around for a while, have to remember that the personal fate of you politically, the fate of your uh, policies, is dependent ultimately on the fate of the institution. To the degree to which you demonize opponents on the floor in debate, and the degree to which you run against Congress as an institution, may give you a short-term benefit, but in the long term, it doesn't hurt you, your cause, or the institution. Now, how you imbue new members with the idea of this collective fate, I wish I had a solution to, uh, to that. But that's the culture and the attitude factor, which is probably the most important uh, one. So people think before they speak, look at the long-term consequences, remember the point the of the institution, remember that winning points in the short run uh, isn't really the name of the, the game. In terms of rules and procedures, let me quickly bullet nine ideas. Uh, one is one that Don mentioned before, I believe more compact scheduling would help with more interaction between members. If you were here five days a week, three weeks out of a month, you're going to interact, you're going to get to know each other as indiv individuals, there'd be more chance for informal uh, discussion. A lot of times, the only time you see your colleagues is they're running for the uh, national airport on Thursday afternoon for the Tuesday to Thursday uh, uh, group. So the more you're around, the more you're likely to have this kind of sense of human beings as opposed to opponents in the process. Secondly, uh, mentioned before, but I'll just reinforce it, that the problem with the rules isn't so much with the content, but it's with their fair, firm, and consistent enforcement. The legitimacy that members see in the rules and the legitimacy the public sees in the rules will be enhanced by that fair, firm, and consistent enforcement. Third, the complexity of the rules, which allow clever individuals to win the day in cases where there's a majority on the other side, where there's a substantive argument that's compelling on the other side, I think tends to mean you know, Congress. Now, the radical solution is simplify the rules, make Congress look more like the decision-making bodies that are run by Robert's Rules of Order that we all are somewhat familiar with. That's probably pretty radical, given the strategic advantage of having complex rules. At a minimum, I think Congress needs to do more to explain its rules to the public, to find a way that uh, the public can understand at least what is going, uh, going on. Fourth, limiting access to the media is not the answer. When Congress first looked at this question of putting the television cameras, and the argument was, to know us is to love us. You know, now, 20 years later, I'm afraid you've come to the conclusion that familiarity breeds contempt, that uh, if you look at the people who watch you carefully, there is some room for concern. Surveys of C-SPAN viewers, for example, show that they are considerably more critical of Congress than the public as a whole. But there is a silver lining. They are critical, but not cynical. They are less cynical than the public as, as, a, as a whole. So they are concerned about the way things are being done, but they have a great deal of hope that things could, you know, could improve. So I think seeing Congress in action you know, does help in that, uh, that sense. Turning off the cameras, I think, is impossible. I think politically, it would be about as messy as putting toothpaste back in the toothpaste uh, tube. You know, we've gone over that, uh, that bridge, and I think you need to move forward. One thing that I think might help would be to turn the cameras over to C-SPAN, the floor cameras, I'm saying. There's a great deal of confusion in many people's minds, and what seems like a conflict of interest, here you are producing the program that shows you. 
And I think C-SPAN over 20 years has shown itself as an honest broker that can do fair and complete uh, coverage. And you would avoid this feeling among many viewers that, well, if they control what's going on, why they look so bad? You know, that, you know, give it to them, let them cover it uh, as, they, as they might. I think there also is a great deal of room for Congress to use some of the new technologies to try to spread more information about the Congress. The Thomas Webb page is a, is, is a good you know, first step, but some of that material is incomplete. It's not very timely. There are certain things that have been embargoed, like you know, votes and things such as that. Uh, the more you spread out there in terms of the public record, I think the, the more trust people will have. Number five, this is the hot one that came up after last time, is one-minute speeches. In my mind, one-minute speeches are seldom more than soundbite mongering by the members and allow the press to go out and graze and pick up those outrageous statements that you know, come up in the evening news. I guess I personally don't see a great deal of advantage of people speaking to a relatively empty chamber about you know, disconnected ideas. I think there's some value out there. Perhaps moving this, the one-minute speeches at the end of the day would, uh, would help be a little less likely that evening news would pick them up, perhaps having one day a week with one-minute speeches to fill that sort of information uh, uh, in. But you know, I think one-minute speeches are a real, you know, real problem, and they don't really you know, give you a very good image in the, in the process. Number six, forms of address. The overly flowerly forms of address on the floor of the House fall rel relatively strangely on the public ear. When you're listening to a debate and someone says, my distinguished and eloquent, eloquent and learned colleague from the great and productive state of Minnesota is mistaken in his basic assumptions. I'm not sure whether I should believe the form of address or the challenge you've made to the member, and it sounds awfully hypocritical. Uh, I understand the, the desire to talk in the third person, and I think that's, you know, that's fine, but these overly flowery forms of address you know, really sound awfully hypocritical you know, out in the real world out there. Number seven. Uh, continue to enforce the, the strict limits on revision and extension of remarks. The duplicity of saying one thing and then having it recorded in another way uh, is only an invitation for the press to uh, have stories of duplicity and to undermine the, uh, the you know, view of the Congress. Number eight, taking words down. When you're considering taking words down, this may be a place where new technology might really help, and that is that rather than waiting for the clerk to go and find those words and read those wor words, Conceivably, you could play those words back, the video of those words back. That would not only give you the content, but it also would give you the intonation of how it was, was spoken. It would give you more raw material to judge whether they should be taken down or not. Also, you have to be very careful that the member who has his words taken down is not given the last word. Now, I know the rules say you're not supposed to have the last word, but often, under the guise of apologizing, the person gets up and then repeats the same offensive words uh, again. They get a double shot in the, uh, in the process. So the way that's enforced is, is awfully important. And number nine, uh, avoid making the presiding officer look foolish. When you have the parliamentarian whispering in the ear or handing cards to the presiding uh, officer, they look like a puppet up there, and they look like they're not in control, particularly when conflictual situations are involved couple of minor su suggestions there. One is maybe a different way to communicate uh, between the presiding officer and the parliamentarian. Perhaps more importantly, as we were talking about before, the idea of just putting anybody up there as a presiding officer kind of gets to be like amateur day, and uh, that's not a place for amateurs. And perhaps we ought to limit presiding to a relatively small cadre of individuals who have the temperament, the skill, the willingness, the interest to have learned the rules. So when they're up there, you know they're in charge, they know what is going, going, going on. None of these are silver bullets, none of them will solve the problem over, overnight, but each of them I think may move in the, in the right direction. Uh, and again, I compliment the committee for, for looking at this very sensitive kind of issue because, because self-examination really is the first step to improvement. Thank you. I'm going to uh, depart from what I prepared because this discussion has been so interesting to sort of set me off trying to integrate some of these things. Now, I have a slightly different perspective than some of the other people do. Uh, I think that this is a far more serious problem than some others have suggested, and also that it's not a new problem. Uh, incivility makes people unwilling to make deals with each other, to bargain with each other, to talk to each other. In a way that we've talked about Oxford Union debates, that would be wonderful. But first of all, before we even think of all this, we have to figure out 
how we're going to get people talking civilly to each other so the Oxford Union debates don't become, like at least one of them did, a shouting match. And this is also not a new problem. It's been going on more or less in Congress for at least 25 years, building up to where it's gotten now to the point where we are now holding hearings on this. Uh, it's gotten a lot worse as we progressed over the past 25 years, but it is not new. And I don't want to give the impression that the last Congress was setting up something, a whole new phenomena that we had never seen before. What we have seen is an increasing partisan edge to these debates. Back in the 1970s, you have random pot shots from members who didn't like each other and who may have used words that Professor Jameson's database wouldn't pick up. If they called each other a liar, her database would pick it up. But if they called each other devious, that database wouldn't pick it up. And in contrast to uh, my friend Steve Francis's comment, I actually thought it was wonderful when former Speaker John McCormick once commented in what was then the mark of incivility in the 1960s, I have a minimum high regard for the gentleman from. That seems to me to be a whole lot better than calling somebody a liar. So this is a problem that is serious. It's been around for a while. And I also don't think that changes in the rules are going to have much of an effect. Now, I hate to be too academic about this, but this is an argument that I've been preaching for a long time. And it's now not necessarily just because of me, but I think become reasonably accepted among academic students of legislative bodies. The rules are not given from God and all of a sudden handed to you on tablets saying, this is what you will do. The rules reflect the nature of the institution. And when the rules change, they change because people's values change, because the nature of conflicts change. So the rules, in a sense, are part of the institution's culture. And to say, well, we need a whole new set of rules designed by some academics to make you folks behave better, that's not going to do it. So that if you give the speaker more powers, you're going to do exactly what Mr. Dreyer said earlier on. You're going to have some people say, this is undemocratic. If you cut out one-minute speeches, people will make these same arguments during the course of regular debate. If you say you can't do it during regular debate, you'll do it in committee meetings. And if you can't do it in committee meetings, you'll call a reporter and hold a press conference. People will find a way of making their views known. And this has always been the case, and I don't see any reason why it will not continue to be the case. And I would love Oxford Union debates. In fact, my whole argument for what would be an ideal situation for debating is very much like either the Oxford Union or a more American firing line, where you have people who are sharp partisans, who have their own ideologies, but who at the end of the time you can clearly see are good friends, like each other, respect each other, even though they disagree. And at the end of the day, one side wins, the other side loses, and that's it. You don't appeal to the Supreme Court because the judges said that you lost. Or you don't conduct the filibuster because you're afraid you might lose. I know it's the wrong chamber, but it's the same basic idea. Basically, if you are going to get anything like Oxford Union or a firing line type debate, you've got to have members who are committed to this process to begin with. Now, what you can do, as Mr. Hall said, there are 25 radicals on each side. Maybe you could exclude all those 25 radicals on each side from the debate, but then you get charges that you've rigged the game. Or the next day, when you go back to the regular uh, meetings for the Committee of the Whole, all hell will break loose there. So if you do get an Oxford Union debating style, what you're doing is postponing the problem. What I think we really need to do is try to come, first of all, to some bipartisan agreement at a very simple level as to what types of language are acceptable and what types of language aren't. And I appreciate the comments of both Mr. Dreyer and Mr. Hall uh, at the earlier panel in which they said that it's absolutely important to try to figure out what the boundaries are of civil discourse and remove those simple boundaries from partisan debate. 
I have a seven-year-old who's in first grade. There are three first grade teachers at my son's elementary school. And I would expect that all three would apply the same standards of discipline to the same kids when they get out of hand. I don't think that if my son were in a different class, that the standards of discipline should be different. And you get that now. You know, there is no Democratic or Republican uh, right to call somebody else a liar or anything else. And I think that we need to have a meeting of the party leaders to decide what statements are simply out of bounds, and then those leaders telling their members, you cannot go beyond this level. Now, beyond that, this is just sort of the tip of the iceberg. My overall thesis, and I'll try to uh, wrap this up reasonably quickly, is that the nastiness in Congress reflects the nastiness in society. Yesterday in the New York Times, there was a big article about airline passengers who were punching out crews and causing all sorts of havoc. This is not just members of Congress creating this. Big stories about drivers behaving badly. It's tough to get service in a store. If you want to go to a, a store and get good service, you have to pay extra money uh, for it. So this is not something that Congress can solve itself. But Congress can take some steps, and I have some unconventional steps that I think Congress can take. I think that members have hit the nail right on the head, as some of the other panelists have as well, when they say that members of Congress don't know each other the way they used to, and when they do, they don't like each other. And from what we know about studies of civil society now, getting people to meet with people of different backgrounds and to interact with people of different backgrounds helps to take some of the sharp edges off conflict. And the one thing that I've seen in my own research and in uh, some other work done by social psychologists is that sports seems to help. The old congressional baseball games used to help, and beyond baseball games, because we're not going to have time for a baseball league here, is the gym. Used to be a place where members would socialize across party lines, get to know each other, and feel good about each other. Members need to spend more time in the gym. Now, how do we do that? I have a fairly radical su suggestion here, and I sort of throw it out because I know it's way too radical, to spend at least an hour to an hour and a half each day when there is no legislative business conducted. And maybe we could put that in with what uh, Don Wolfensberger and Steve Francis have said about making this into a five-day week. So we can perhaps extend the week, but create some downtime during the day when no legislative business, that means no, com no floor business, no committee business, no subcommittee business can take place. Now, you can't force people to go to the gym. But having this downtime might encourage them to go to the gym, if not that, to have lunch together, to try to meet each other. And maybe even the leadership could provide uh, some more common grounds for people to get together across party and ideological lines to get to meet each other. And once this happens, I think, and also once people get perhaps adjourn earlier in the evenings, maybe we can take some of the rougher edges off the Congress. The way these sort of leisure activities where people get to know each other take some of the rough edges off the rest of us. So my own research shows. And if, if people are saying, well, we have so much to do how are we going to be able to adjourn by 7 o'clock every day and take an hour to an hour and a half off in the middle of the day? Well, I'll say I could save you an hour and a half right there. April 17th, we spent virtually an hour and a half on the taking down process and on what has become routine over the last uh, at least more than a decade, having these consistent votes at the beginning of each day on approving the journal. In the days when the congressional norms were stronger and there was uh, more of a sense of reciprocity and give and take between members, all the stuff at the beginning of the day, all this routine uh, was routine. They were approved by voice vote, uh, didn't take quite so long a period of time. If we could get rid of a lot of this partisan bickering over minor sorts of things, maybe we could get rid of some of it over major sorts of things as well. Saving time and giving us a chance to perhaps get to know each other better 
and maybe ultimately leading to situations where we're able to talk policy to each other and sort of look for some middle ground. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Testimony is very helpful, and I'd, I'd like to uh, just raise one issue on, on this question of uh, C-SPAN coverage. We see most of the focus on, uh, obviously, the, the partisan debates. Do you think that, uh, and we have C-SPAN covering this hearing, obviously, and the battle hasn't been too great in here today, uh, but do you think that we should take steps to try and uh, gain more access for C-SPAN and other media to some of the uh, less than rancorous uh, meetings that take place here? Sure. You know, a lot of people say that watching, you know, Congress on C-SPAN is kind of you know, like watching paint dry, you know, you know, unless there's a bubble, you know, you're not going to you know, have much uh, excitement right. in the process. But there is a cadre of people out there who is in, are interested in various kinds of, uh, kinds of issues, and I guess I'm a believer in more information, not less. Uh, I've watched Congress for a long time, and, you know, basically I've got a good feeling that you know, good people, reasonable people trying to do a good job, that doesn't come across uh, very well. And I think, you know, you know, in the long run, I think that really to know you is to love you. But uh, in the short run, I'm not sure that's, uh, that's the case. I think that the more people can see regular routine discourse where people say, my distinguished colleague from, the sort of flowery language that Steve may not like so much, the better attitude they're going to have towards Congress. I think that something like that cannot hurt and probably would help at least a small well, I think amount. Steve's point was actually using flowery language and then slamming the person. Oh, okay, right? yeah, yeah, okay. It was a juxtaposition Sorry, okay. of, the, yeah, right. of, the, of those right, two. Yeah. Right. But the more flowery language, maybe it would even spread by osmosis so that people would sort of say, oh, this is sort of a good way to behave towards other people. Great. Mr. McGinnis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess a couple comments. I, I have some disagreement with you on in regards to expansion of the media and so on. I think you have to control it pretty carefully. Media doesn't sell if it's boring. A lot of the uh, transactions that we have that go on here on a daily basis are very boring. And the media is not going to cover it, or if the media covers it, if you have a boring speech on the floor, it seems to me, and we allow cameras uh, the ability to access the floor or sweep the floor, the focus won't be on the boring speaker. Instead, the focus would be on the empty chambers. And, uh, and that brings a lot of discredit, I think, upon the Congress. Second of all, the reason a lot of it appears boring is because if the average person out there, the average citizen, doesn't understand the procedures here. These procedures are very complicated. You don't have time in 15 seconds to explain to the TV viewer what those are. So I'm a little reluctant on the uh, expand access. I I'd also like to comment um, on expanding the week to five days. That works fine if you live inside the Beltway. If you're someone such as myself, I my congressional district geographically is larger than the state of Florida. I can't, I, I have to take two flights to be able to get home to that district, and then within the district, I usually have to charter aircraft to get around the district. And expanding, keeping me here an additional week, and out of my district for an additional day, excuse me, keep me here an additional day to expand the week, therefore, it means you have to pull the day from me back in the district. And what's happened since the, the 50s and 60s that we've seen in Congress is back in the 50s, 60s, maybe even the 70s, uh, people expected their congressional people, once elected, to go to Washington, and then they'd see them again in the summer, they'd see them again at Christmas. Now, through these years, since that period of time, people have, the constituents have expected, have come to expect to see you back in your district almost every weekend, and many of us do that now. And if you're not back, then the media goes to some delight, in my opinion, to say you have forgotten where you come from and so on. It has gotten to the extent in my district, for example, on uh, July 4th, I have 70 some parades in my district, and uh, we can make we can make <laughs> we can make uh, four of them. They're all at 10 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and we can make uh, uh, four of them, in which we have four people, four communities who say, "Guys, he's back here. We see him a lot," and I have 66 of them who say he's forgotten where he came from. We never see him anymore. You can tell it's not an election year. He's not at our parade and so on and. So I don't know how we overcome that, but I think expanding the week here, plus the fact there are a lot of us such as myself 
My family lives in a very desirable place, uh, which is not Washington, D.C. <laughs> and uh, so, so keeping me here an additional day keeps me away from my own family. An additional day and creates problems. And we saw a lot of how this worked when we had the contract for America, where we were working that type of schedule. We were working, and I'll tell you, we had a lot of domestic problems with the members. Uh, and it's the same thing with the journey early. The people that live within, that go home every night or have their families here would like to journey early. Those of us who travel into the district would just soon work till 11 o'clock at night and be able to wrap it up on Thursday and go back to our districts. So there's a lot of internal conflict, and, and the majority leader has a tough time. So, I mean, even here on our committee, it's, it's tough for the chairman. He'd like to call a meeting at 2 in the afternoon on a Tuesday or a Monday. I can't, if, if in order for me to make a 2 o'clock meeting here, I say on a Tuesday, I have to leave Monday for my district. If it's 5 o'clock, just a difference of three hours, I can leave the Tuesday morning. So there's a lot of that that you have to consider. But I agree. You know, I, I served in the state legislature before I came here in the camaraderie. A couple things that were different there. One, we had instant voting. So you didn't just go to the floor, vote, and leave. You sat around the floor. And during that period of time was kind of like being at the gym. You visited with people and so on. The other thing that was interesting was we had assigned seats. So you got to know the people on both sides and the people behind you. You kind of got to know those people that encircled you around your seat. Here, of course, in the U.S. Congress, on the Senate side, they do have assigned seats. But on the House side, we don't have assigned seats. So little things like that. And, Little things like the pressure now in Congress about the guilt feeling for, uh, for you to travel on government business to another country. Those kind of things have taken away a lot of the tools of camaraderie yeah. that you that, both have yeah. highlighted that should, we, we need to work on. Let me comment quick on the media and then secondly on, on, on the schedule. I, I wasn't advocating kind of opening the chamber to all the networks and everyone else. I think I'm really thinking in terms of uh, someone like C-SPAN who's made a commitment to say we're going to do full form we're going to essentially focus on the person who is speaking, and we may give you a little feel of, of the chamber, but a kind of responsible kind of coverage. Because I think you're absolutely right that you know, there's cherry picking by the by the media of, of conflict or empty seats or whatever. I'm wondering, in terms of the schedule, whether you know, if you had the same number of days back in the district per month, whether that would solve at least the obviously wouldn't solve the domestic question, but would solve some of the demands if your constituents knew that you were available the first week of every month. Uh, and they could schedule events. If they really want you to be there, they could schedule events around, around that. And it's relatively recent that members of Congress have had this ability to travel back and forth. If you chart the you know, travel uh, allowances, you know, in the old days it was eight trips or four trips, or in the early days you got, you got the trip here and you got the trip back, and that was, uh, uh, that was all. And uh, you, know, you may you'd be able to more efficiently use your time back in the district and efficiently use your time uh, time here. As I say, it doesn't solve the domestic uh, issue. Yeah, in, in fact, uh, that, that was brought up before. Well, let's go ahead and have the first week of every month back in your district, and then you work here six days or five days a week here. The difficulty is then everybody does schedule into that one week. So the one week you have back in the district is a week that you are going nonstop, full speed, and certainly for those of us who've decided that, uh, you know, that, we, that, that our families are better back where they, in our hometowns, uh, that's even more of a disadvantage than an advantage. Uh, Mr. McGinnis, let me say that I am more willing to grant you your point, uh, say, okay, you need to have uh, a shorter week. But also, I still would want this free time and saying that what we should take it out of would be the amount of time we spend trying to get legislation. Because what's happening now, the way I see it, is that there's a lot of work that because of this stalemate, in part because people don't trust each other, it never gets anywhere. So you have a lot of wheel spinning. And at the end of the day, all you have are these perpetual motion machines that you can call congressional committees. Not this one. <laughs> uh, and you wind up with nothing accomplished because there is so much work, people don't get to know each other, they don't get to interact with each other, that at the end of the day, all this hard work, I won't say goes for naught, but gets stymied. Would, would the gentleman yield for a moment? <laughs> I, I've been very much wanting to get into this discussion because for four years here, I chaired a group called Organization Study and Review when we were in the majority. 
which really dealt with the rules of the house. Unfortunately, my schedule will not allow me to stay and tell you everything I want to say about this. Uh, however, I do want to make a couple of points before I go. We, we've discussed all of this at OSR. We tried it all. We tried doing wait one minute. We tried to do away with special orders. I think you have to remember that there was a concerted effort, really, to discredit the House. I mean, there's no question about that, and, and the people who had been here prior to that time were all that were stunned at that. The, the, there was a total change in attitude that I think will take a long time to, to cure. Uh, I think that's a very important point. Secondly, we tried the whole process about how often should we be here and, and go home. We found that every month except June has a holiday in it, and that we thought that holiday week would be wonderful, we would expand that, and that would be our week at home. The others, we would work here, but as Scott points out, you can't do that for people who have families and small children back home. We can't find the perfect process here. It isn't possible. One of the things that, that we talked about is what, what do we do about chairs? How do we rotate them? And I'm anxious to see how this works because nobody could ever tell me what to do with a used chair. <laughs> I mean, where does he or she go? Back to the bottom of that committee or to another committee of old chairs? I mean, you know, we, ne <laughs> we never could arrive at that. The thing is, it really, I think that we ought to say to the public, that our business here is to create legislation, not to go to the gym. I have to tell you, I think that would, uh, you can, you can not imagine what that backlash would be to say, we're, sorry, we're leaving now to go to the gym for an hour and a half. I mean, I haven't been in there since I've been here. And it shows. But <laughs> the, um, the important point that I want to make is that we're not going to find that perfect system. And I think the people of America need to realize that this is a deliberative body and that we disagree, but we find a solution. The important point here, and the one is that our allies one day may be our adversaries the next. And when we lose, as you point out, you don't go to the Supreme Court. When we lose, we start over the next day. And we, term after term, we come back and we do all this over again. But I think we have a whole lot more fondness for each other and concern for each other sometimes than it shows. But our job is to come down here uh, and, and represent the people who sent us down here and do it vigorously. The problem is I don't think that people should be afraid in the country of watching. Maybe, you know, the, uh, maybe that's what's distressing, but maybe we need to say, as I sometimes do in my district, that's the way it works. I, it didn't work any differently for me when I was in the state legislature in Albany. We did the same thing. We argued back and forth, but that didn't mean that we were we were ready to go out and fight a duel with our adversaries, not at all. Uh, and I, th I think that's the important point we really yeah. need to make to people. This is the way legislation gets made. Now, some of it may is certainly too acerbic, and, and I, let me make one other statement before I have to go. And that, as, and my service in this house, which has been the most important thing other than my family in my life, the honor of it, I am persuaded that it is more important the things that happen here on this hill, the presidents come and go. But we have a grave obligation here. And civility can be part of it, but uh, I think the idea of th there's so many other things that, that we need uh, to worry about, about other than whether or not people think that, uh, you know, we're not sitting here waiting for the king's budget. Let me put it that way. And our, our, it's our obligation here as a, one of the third, uh, the three branches of this government is to make ourselves heard and to do our part. And now I've got to go because my schedule calls me wait, but I thank okay, you very thank much you. for the time. Thank you, Scott, for yielding, and thank you, David. May, may I just add one, one of the last? Yes, sir. One, one quick response. I think that civility is important because it is the, the only thing that, per, that will allow compromise to keep going. And I also understand that on both sides, there are charges about who started the fight. And I have my own views as to who started the fight, but they're not really relevant. I think that what happens when you get a fight like this is to get both of the contending parties, and now the, the, the parties are the contending parties, to back down and say, wait a minute. It doesn't really matter who started the fight. It doesn't matter if you say, well, it was Newt Gingrich on the one hand, or it was the autocratic democratic leadership on the other hand. These are the charges that have been made for a long time. At some point, just like ultimately we were, we were trying to do in Bosnia for a long time, we need to get the parties to sit down and stop the blame game. Then they will be able perhaps to treat each other more civilly and we'll get more of a chance to get legislation enacted.
if your mother didn't teach you to be civil before you got to Congress, I'm not sure we're going to teach anybody to be civil You're while we're here. You're probably right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we can try. Okay. Thank you very much, you. Louise. Let me, uh, let me, as we close, uh, ask, uh, I'm going to state, put in the record a statement from our colleague, uh, Deborah Price, and with, them, with unanimous consent, it'll appear in the record. Um, some may want to propose from this that we uh, mandate that no congressional district have more than four Independence Day parades uh, per district. That might be one idea that has come from this. But actually, we have had, uh, I think, a, a wide range of very helpful recommendations from the two of you and from the last panel and from the report. And I uh, know that this will be an ongoing discussion because one of the points that was made as we looked at the uh, retreat that was held was that it was simply a starting point. It was not by any means a panacea. Uh, the recommendations that you all have offered are, are uh, clearly not a panacea to this uh, issue, but I believe the fact that we are discussing it can go a long way to uh, addressing what is obviously seen uh, by many of us as a very serious problem. So I thank you very much for your very thoughtful work on this and for being with us. And as I said to the last two panelists, I hope very much that you'll stay in, in touch with us as we proceed with it. And with that, the uh, subcommittee stands adjourned. Representative Dreyer and his colleagues return to session later today at 2 p.m. Eastern Time for a pro forma session. Legislative business resumes tomorrow. Members plan debate on a bill that would deregulate public housing and consider an emergency spending bill for disaster relief and operations in Bosnia and Iraq. Live house coverage.